and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that still sees the X. A little pandering there. So anyway, once again, we have arrived at the end of another season here in Archive Land. And as has become kind of unintentional tradition around here, I want to close out the season with one of my long brewing, long gestating projects. So with that, today I'm going to give a much belated second opinion behind Tecmon on the late, not so lamented CX or Compatible Expansion Audio Noise Reduction System. And the big difference between Tecmon's video and mine is that I found myself falling down one of my patented rabbit holes with this one. And before you ask, yeah, this is going to be one of my little pissing off the audiophiles slash audiofools type episodes. Techmoan's video already did a good job at rounding up the history of CX noise reduction, but just to bring everyone up to speed, here's the basic lowdown. In the spring of 1981, CBS, as in Sony's music department, announced the arrival of CX encoded vinyl records. The idea was that CX would ultimately function as the vinyl equivalent to Dolby noise reduction. Like Dolby on cassette decks, CBS hoped that CX would ultimately become more or less standard on turntables and receivers. Also like Dolby, encoded material, so they claimed, could still be played back raw with little adverse effect. The first round of CX, or Compatible Expansion Discs, dropped that summer. Thing is, despite teetering on the edge of being open-source technology, neither hardware nor software ever really became readily available. If anything, of the LPs to make it to market, I'd be willing to bet heavily they were almost entirely purchased by people completely oblivious to the technology. Back in December of 2017, I put out an episode called Dynagroove and Friends, which was about some of the gimmicks and quirks of vinyl records to surface between the 50s and 80s. As I was researching that episode, by chance, Tecmon put out a video on CX noise reduction, which, as it turns out fairly accurately, claimed it was better, worse, and about the same as a standard vinyl record. More on that later. Anyway, to tie in with the Tecmon video, despite my inability to decode such things, I pulled my two CX encoded LPs for my own video, and it's stuck up my craw ever since. Over the next four plus years, I kept a mostly fruitless running Fleabay search for, ideally, an outboard CX unit, which were theoretically capable of decoding and encoding, and I also started hoarding CX encoded vinyl and their standard counterparts. It took until early 2022, but a phase linear Model 220 finally turned up on Fleabay. Despite the $120 price tag for a probably non-working unit, I took the plunge anyway. It was the only outboard CX unit I'd ever seen at any price. And no, the more common ones meant to be used with a Laserdisc player don't work for the LPs. In fact, those have to be reset for each specific Laserdisc player. As is all too common with me, this whole CX thing has proven to be a massive rabbit hole. First off, as expected, the phase linear, henceforth the 220, was not in fully working order. The right decoded channel was dead. 
But in its own twisted, warped way, this slowly, ultimately led me to the discovery that CX noise reduction was effectively open source technology. No proprietary chips or anything were involved, and by turn, any sufficiently skilled audio geek could fashion their own CX units for just the cost of parts. Indeed, the inside of the 220 was a little bit sparse about akin to what I'd imagine a fair number of amateur builds might have looked like, which is a bit unnerving given that Faze Lanier was usually known for some pretty nice gear. For what it's worth, yes, there were amateur build kits available. So God bless the boys who make the noise on 16th Avenue. Given the dead right channel, I figured it needed recapped. And I was wrong. Nonetheless, I figured the law of averages would dictate that it needed something in the soldering department. <laughs> A tremendous weakness of mine. So, of course, I opted to send my uber-rare 220 off to someone just a little more qualified. I sent off the 220 plus a CD of transfers of my two oldest raw CXLPs off to my good friend Ben, no relation, the madman behind classical gas emissions. In his own words, here's what went down. So Ben had contacted me regarding this CX noise reduction unit that he had picked up. And uh, he said, I picked this thing up, and one of the channels is dead, and I was wondering if you could uh, do a recapping on it for me. And I said, sure, yeah, send it over, and I'll, and I'll put some new capacitors in the thing. So it showed up here, and uh, I fired it up, and sure enough, one of the channels was dead. So I was like, okay, well, let's just do a recapping on it, because replacing capacitors that have dried up over the years, like, sometimes it will bring audio components back to life. And that, that's through my experience. I've been successful in doing that. So there was only like, I think, 10 capacitors or something in this thing. So I replaced them all, fired it up, and the channel was still dead. I thought, okay, well, it's time to, you know, get out the scope here and start poking around to see if I can find anything else wrong with it. So I started poking around, and there were, I think, three or four um, quad-op amps in it. And they're chips. They look, uh, they look, they look kind of like this. So they're, they're um, 14 pin chips. So I, uh, I started poking around with them and uh, three, um, four inputs were working on one of them, but it only had three outputs. So I thought, okay, well, let's go dig around in my junk and see if I have one to replace it with. Sure enough, I didn't have one, but I did find a single op amp which uh, comes in a package like this. It's got four pins on it. So I figured, well, this is it's, it's uh, all the same specs. I could just piggyback it on top of the dead one, and uh, the, the unit should come to life. And sure enough, I piggybacked it, wired all the pins up, and lo and behold, the unit fired up. Both of the channels were working, and then I was able to listen to this... Uh, this lovely CD that Ben uh, sent over to me with uh, some CX encoded records and oh, they, they were absolutely terrible. <laughs> Anyways, back to other Ben. The Techmoan video nails the history lesson end of things pretty well, but its source for the basic scheme of CX was a bit oversimplified. In the name of cutting down on noise and raising the dynamic range in the decibel sense, CX and competitor DBX noise reduction, the latter of which I've covered twice now, both companded, compressed, and expanded the signal. The big difference between the two was that DBX was linear, companding everything at a 2 to 1 to 2 ratio. CX only suppressed the quieter parts of a recording, anything below minus 40 decibel volts. Otherwise, CX was non-linear. The gain level of everything above that magic minus 40 gets progressively leveled off, and after a certain point, the gain level actually goes down, as in the signal gets recompressed. In the end, a potential 26 dB of dynamic range can be gained, 
20 dB down, plus an extra 6 dB of headroom. I was just assuming that the calibration of the 220 would be off, and I really have no idea if I was right or not. A manual has proven to be the unicorn of this topic. But I had read that the retail outboard CX units came with a calibration record, so I figured that'd be as good a start as any. I wound up having to import one from the Netherlands, as there were none to be found in North America. Now, given the similarities to Dolby noise reduction, I opted to calibrate the 220 like I would an outboard Dolby unit, keeping the two audio channels equal and in tune with each other, so to speak. My method proved to be wrong, but in my defense, not by much. Quietly tucked away in the January 1982 issue of Popular Electronics was a commentary article that mentioned that the unit was to be calibrated using the LED in the back of the unit. If the LED is solidly lit, the unit is calibrated. Given that the LED only lights up for a brief period in the potentiometer, and that under my homebrew calibration that LED was weak and unsteady, I wrongly figured that the LED was just dying on me. As it also turned out, that CX calibration record is so utterly basic that really any LP with test tones would have sufficed. As far as my own tuning went, to my ear, it seemed like the right channel was coming in a bit stronger than the left. However, when I started playing my CX encoded discs, I found that the stereo image always seemed to tilt slightly left. Now, whether it was the original design, or the new amp that was put in, or any other previous tweaks anyone else might have made, is anyone's guess, but the timing comes up a hair slow. All the waveforms of my recordings seem to start like this. The aforementioned Popular Electronics issue featured a lengthy centerpiece article written by one John Roberts. After Techmoan's video, someone linked Roberts the video on a forum, which Roberts proceeded to comment at length to. It was there that I learned that the timing on the existing 1981 CX decoders was off by some 10%. Worse yet, I learned that the initial wave of 1981 CX encoded LPs were all off. In response, instead of properly fixing things, CBS just went back and made the miscalibration the new normal specification and all future CXLPs were tuned to the initial mistake. In short, I have no way of knowing if my 220 dates to before or after this little revelation. I do know that the circuitry of the 220 and other CX units was soon dropped to a single chip as opposed to three, so it's at least early-ish. All I know is that my CX encoded Teramasa Hino and Johnny Mathis LPs, both from that initial 1981 wave, play somewhat out of whack against their standard counterparts, especially the Mathis record. The world has stopped and everyone's asleep. Baby, let's not wake them.
The most tantalizing thing about an outboard CX unit to me is that the rear of the unit makes it <laughs> seem that you can use it as an encoder and not just a decoder. So for a quick test, I ran a CD of my own instrumental stuff via the 220 onto my cassette deck. The results made my stomach sink. The recordings now had a slow, irregular throbbing to them. After that, because I'm apparently a masochist, I did another round of tests, this time on my reel-to-reel -reel deck. Amusingly, given the music industry's anti-home taping attitude at the time, it seems like the only recording the 220 was good for was dubbing the CX decoded LPs to tape, which actually turned out quite well. <laughs> Of course, the punchline to all this came towards the end of testing when I found a German blurb on the European model of the 220. The tape in and outputs are actually meant for when an external preamp is being used for the turntable.
When the first CXLPs dropped in mid-1981, it was met with protest from engineers and some artists as well, the former occasionally getting a little melodramatic about it. The complaint was that CX was quite noticeable when played back without decoding, which the vast, vast majority of consumers would be doing. Specifically, the engineers felt that the dynamic range of their recordings was getting squashed by CX, and given that the dynamic range and frequency response of most average major label vinyl stock wasn't all that great to begin with, their recordings, which were already out of necessity getting a little skewed on disc, would wind up that much worse. And I'm hard-pressed to disagree. In the end, to the best of my knowledge, no CX-enabled turntables were ever released in North America. As far as vinyl decoders in general went, only the 220 and a precious few receivers ever saw the light of day on this side of the Atlantic. The last CX-encoded LPs rolled off the line in no later than the summer of 1983. Now, CX did find a rather short second life on CED video discs, but the last of those rolled off the line in 1986. Also, around 1987, a CX-encoded flavor of FM radio broadcasting, known as FMX, went into use on a small handful of U.S. radio stations. The results were met with criticism over stunted signal reach and bad sound quality. FMX quietly disappeared in 1989. Most famously, CX noise reduction went into regular use on laser discs. As in the vast majority of stereo laser discs manufactured from 1984 on. But, funnily enough, CX had less to do with sound quality on laser discs as it eliminated a crosstalk issue between part of the video signal and the right stereo audio track, making CX more useful outside of its intended purpose. If I had to peg it, I would put CX encoded vinyl on the same level as Dolby B encoded cassettes, and operative word cassettes, 1 and 7 eighths inches per second audio cassette. And I say that because even though Dolby is a companding system, it's so gentle that in the end it just feels more like a filter to me. And to me that's what it feels like with CX encoded vinyl. It, it winds up right on that same plane. And I'm one of those people that if I have a Dolby B encoded cassette, I almost never have the Dolby on on the tape deck because it feels like it takes some of the music with it. Yeah, it cuts down on the noise, but uh, at what price? And I would much rather have that extra space, that extra air in the sound uh, sound stage, so to speak. And uh, so it kind of breaks my heart after all this time and effort and money to have to give CX just a big fat meh. But yeah, I'll take a standard LP any day over one of those CX discs. And really, when I really think about it, and with all the time I've spent with this, I feel like I can honestly say that CX doesn't accomplish anything that you couldn't already do with just better vinyl stock and wise mastering choices. When done right, vinyl can sound really, really good, and you don't need any special gear for it. It'll sound good on a cheap turntable, and it'll sound fantastic on a really nice turntable. So, uh, yeah, to me it just feels futile. And yes, you will have a little more surface noise, even if it's really great vinyl stock, but I, I think the trade-off is worth it. 
So anyway, uh, that's the end of my little rant there. And that's going to be it for this episode and it for this season. And uh, I feel like I should, uh, since we've picked up a lot of new viewers over the last year, I, I do feel like I should fill you in here. Around this time every year, I back off for a few weeks and I try and maybe do some uh, new incidental music to use on archive. Uh, there's almost always repairs of some sort that need to happen around here. And it's always nice to be able to take just even a day or two off completely. Now, you will not be hurting for new content here. Uh, on the main channel, you will be paid a visit by my old ex-Soviet DJ buddy, Sergi. You will get at least one Ben's Junk or Ben's Junk-esque kind of video, and I do have kind of one of my demented little life mission projects to unload on you. And if I can get it together, I hope to put out the first Archive Thrifting episode of this year. And if that doesn't come together, and I'd say it's a 50-50 shot right now, uh, if it doesn't happen, I have at least one Archive episode that I'd like to do a commentary track for. So yeah, uh, we still got plenty of stuff going on around here. Now, uh, once I, and I should mention before I get to my next point, that at this time of year, I like to post a bunch of stuff to our secondary channel, Archive Annex, and stuff that I think merits posting, but just doesn't fit with any particular archive episode. So uh, vintage commercial breaks and ephemeral films and stuff like that. So anyway, um, getting back on track here, when I do start up again, we will be just a couple weeks beyond the 10th anniversary of the debut of Oddity Archive, and the first full proper regular episode of the new season will be a 10th anniversary special, and I can definitely use the running start this year. Now, as for the actual date, I hope to have something to put out on the day, even if it's just me sitting here at the box for a couple minutes, kind of reminiscing a little, or maybe putting together some little montage or something. But uh, yeah, you have that to look forward to. And of course, we always do record ripoffs uh, in, around the second or third episode once we start up again. And otherwise, that is going to be it. I think that brings you up to speed. So... I will, despite the lack of new proper archive episodes, I will still talk to you again soon. <laughs>